If it's Monday, Russia retaliates, unleashing deadly rocket attacks on Kyiv and other Ukrainian cities following the bombing of a crucial bridge between Russia and Crimea. President Biden condemns Vladimir Putin's strikes as the United Nations holds an emergency session on the war. Plus, control of the Senate is on the line, and it could all come down to Georgia. As that race and the controversy surrounding Republican Senate candidate Herschel Walker intensify, top Republicans are rallying behind their candidate. And a run on edge, massive anti-government protests now entering their fourth week as schoolgirls are now taken to the streets even as the government crackdown increases. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Peter Alexander. For the first time in months, Russian rockets struck Ukraine's capital city, Moscow, firing missiles today on multiple Ukrainian cities in what officials there say were coordinated attacks targeting civilians and infrastructure. The attacks killed at least 11 people nationwide. It injured dozens of others as well. President Volodymyr Zelensky saying that Russia is trying to wipe Ukraine off the face of the earth. Russian President Vladimir Putin said the attacks are retaliation for an explosion over the weekend that damaged a critical bridge to the annexed peninsula of Crimea. That bridge is so critical because it's a key supply line for Russian military forces fighting in Ukraine. Putin labeled the explosion that temporarily halted traffic on the bridge a terrorist attack. The Ukrainians have not publicly admitted responsibility for the explosion. In a televised address, Putin touted today's strikes. He called it revenge for what he described as Ukraine's track record of terrorist actions. He also warned of a tough response to future attacks by Kyiv. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky says that he spoke with President Biden today about his country's air defense, and he called the conversation productive. Meanwhile, President Biden, who warned last week that the world right now is at risk of nuclear Armageddon, condemned Moscow's attacks releasing a statement that read in part, we will continue to impose costs on Russia for its aggression, hold Putin and Russia accountable for its atrocities and war crimes. Tomorrow, G7 leaders will hold a call to discuss the war in Ukraine. But right now, the United Nations General Assembly is holding its own emergency session to address the crisis. U.S. Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield is scheduled to speak near the end of the session, which will not likely take place during this hour, but we will bring you any new developments that do come from this meeting. We're joined now by NBC News correspondent Aaron McLaughlin. She's in Har <coughs> excuse me, Kharkiv. Kelly O'Donnell is at the White House for us this afternoon. Aaron, I want to get to you and get a sense of the reaction on the ground there to these retaliatory strikes by Russia. You're further east from Kyiv, but I know you've been speaking to folks on the ground there as well. Did these catch folks uh, off guard? What are folks saying there? Hey, Peter, well, it really depends on where you are in the country. Here in Kharkiv, this was seen as less of a surprise. Missile strikes on the second largest city in Ukraine are, is a weekly occurrence. So this morning when we heard five explosions targeting the Kharkiv region's energy infrastructure, triggering power outages throughout the region, wasn't necessarily a surprise. In Kyiv, though, the capital was a totally different story. Multiple missile strikes raining down on civilian housing, thoroughfares, a playground, uh, a, one of the main uh, passageways people like to walk across, all struck and damaged by these missiles. People there were completely terrified. Now, in terms of was this a surprise to Ukrainian officials? Well, not necessarily, according to Ukrainian intelligence. They had intelligence that on October 2nd and October 3rd, uh, the Russians were preparing for a large missile attack on civilian infrastructure in Ukraine. So this idea that President Putin is saying this was a retaliation for the Kerch Bridge attack that took place over the weekend, Ukrainian officials are questioning that. They say that the Russians had this in, work, in the works uh, for some days before. And Peter. Aaron, take us to the ground right now. What is the situation specifically as it relates to Kyiv right now? Are people still in those bunkers, those underground subways right now for their own safety? 
You know, people there in Kyiv are on edge. They were terrified, many of them, during the day at the sounds of the sirens took to the metro stations, once again doubling as a, a, a bomb shelter, scenes that we haven't seen really since the early days of this war. But it was really interesting as the sirens subsided, people emerging from those metro stations really continuing daily life, life as usual. You could see people out at the cafes, uh, even an old woman out on the streets cleaning up some of the rubble. People very quickly bounce back. Ukrainians are, are proud of their resiliency, Peter. Aaron, appreciate reporting. Please stay safe there. I want to bring in Kelly O'Donnell to this conversation. And Kelly, we did hear from the president in the form of a statement just landed back at the White House a few minutes ago, we should note. He said that he will impose costs and hold Putin and Russia accountable. Do we know what kinds of actions the White House is weighing at this hour. We don't know the specifics, and I was among the reporters on the South Lawn trying to draw the president over, hoping he might engage with us to find out more about his thinking on this. He declined to take any questions, and there were certainly aides who were traveling with him coming back from Delaware. Uh, he landed, on, of course, on Marine One, who appeared to have a lot of briefing materials, uh, some substantial materials that were uh, brought off uh, Marine One. So what would that look like? We know from uh, the U.K. Prime Minister, Liz Truss, that she is planning to be a part of this G7 meeting tomorrow. So what could the United States be looking for? We know that President Biden considers it one of his foreign policy achievements to be able to bring along uh, the G7 leaders in support of Ukraine and to hold that, uh, that those group of nations together in financial support and in a common view of what they need to do to keep the pressure up. So could that be additional sanctions? Could it be additional issues that would deal with Russia and energy? We're going into the winter months when energy becomes an even more critical issue for uh, Russian uh, supplies to Europe in terms of energy for the everyday European citizen who might be uh, on the receiving end of those kinds of supplies. So there are serious issues in terms of how do you keep that coalition going. And at the same time, the message very clearly from the United States today, Peter, from both the president and from Secretary of State Blinken, has been that these attacks on civilians are so clearly out of bounds yeah. of normal warfare that nations have to respond. And so it can't be a close call. And they're saying that other nations can't stand back, can't be in sort of an absentia mode. They have to be involved in this. So the specifics of the steps, we've always heard that it's about more financial penalties. It's about more ways to make Russia uh, sort of an exile nation in the, in the community of nations to put them uh, at further risk of being disconnected from being able to have a functioning economy and certainly to have them ostracized in the world community. What those steps look like, we need to find out more. And Kelly, as we've been talking about in the course of the next hour or beyond, we think we're going to be hearing, we will be hearing from the ambassador to the United Nations, Linda Thomas Greenfield, as she speaks today at that emergency session. Tomorrow there's going to be uh, a G7 meeting where President Zelensky, as you know, he's going to be a part of this conversation. We haven't heard yet, but it would seem likely that President Biden would participate as well. What more do we know about that conversation as they bring together these world leaders facing off against Russia, frankly? The White House has not confirmed President Biden's participation, but it's hard to imagine that he would not participate, given the fact that uh, we have these emergency circumstances, we have the U.S. in a leadership role among these G7 nations. So we're waiting for a confirmation of that and what it would look like. Those are typically done uh, via video conference and so forth. The president literally just in the last few minutes returned from Delaware and returned to the Oval Office. You see the, the videotape there of him returning to the Oval. And so so by having those G7 leaders meeting and talking about what are the logical next steps and right. what could happen. One of the things that in speaking with Jake Sullivan, the uh, national security advisor, they have been talking about how there have been uh, updates regularly to the defensive posture and the military support posture of the coalition of nations because of things like the nuclear threat and the changing dynamics of what Russia has been doing. And so there may be a piece of that as well, how to best support uh, Ukraine in this particular moment of the war. Yeah, notably this all happens. These new attacks come not just after that attack on the bridge, but after the U.S. announced in the form of Samantha Powers 
own visit to see Volodymyr Zelensky that the U.S. would be providing another $55 million to help with that country, the energy ch challenges they're going to face as we head into the winter months. Kelly O'Donnell, before that, Aaron McLaughlin, thanks to both of you. I want to turn to NBC News senior international correspondent. That, of course, is Kier Simmons. He remains on the ground for us in Moscow. And, and Kier, what is the sense from where you are following that attack on the bridge in Crimea and the barrage of strikes in Ukraine today. What are you hearing from there? Well, President Putin this morning here made very clear, uh, as he said it, that if Ukraine, as he said, it carries out more terrorist attacks on Russian territory, then uh, there will be more harsh measures. And then we uh, saw those missile barrages. And, you know, honestly, I think the question tonight here is how long Russia would be able to sustain that kind of a shift in posture, in its uh, offensive posture in uh, Ukraine. President Putin clearly hopes or, or believes that these threats will intimidate, while at the same time, as you were hearing, in, in Europe and in Ukraine, uh, there is a determination not to be intimidated. But, Peter, you know, uh, in the end, politics is local so often. And for the Kremlin, I think one of the issues here is that there are many, many hardline voices mm -hmm. here in Russia who have been calling for these kinds of attacks. They were celebrating them uh, today. Uh, and President Putin, uh, no, uh, I think President Putin feels that he, he needs to satisfy those calls. So uh, it is a very, very difficult position that the Russian leader is in. Perhaps the most difficult position for him, the most pressure he's been under for 20 years of his leadership. Yeah, those calls coming from loyalists, among others like Dmitry Medvedev, formerly served as that country's president, calling for the dismantling of the Ukrainian regime, as you note. I want to ask you about the news that we have heard from Russia in recent days. They just announced this new commander to lead their forces in Ukraine. He's the same commander that led Russian forces in Aleppo, Syria. For those who don't remember the awful uh, months-long bombing campaign there, it killed hundreds of civilians. I think it was approaching 100 children, indiscriminate airstrikes. What does this move mean for the Russian military and the onslaught that we should anticipate? Yeah, that's General Srovikin, and, uh, you know, he uh, does have that reputation, even going back to 1991, where he was uh, jailed after he uh, commanded the shooting of pro-democracy uh, pro protesters uh, here in Moscow, and, and then that role as a commander on the ground in, in Syria uh, when uh, Aleppo was uh, razed to the ground. Uh, honestly, I, I think it just is another example, and that appointment was made over the weekend after that attack on the bridge. It's just another example, Peter, of a change in stance by President Putin and perhaps a change in stance that, that has been coming. But, you know, I have to tell you that that uh, explosion on the bridge and the damage was shown again and again on Russian television through the weekend. I've not seen that kind of coverage since February when uh, Russia's so-called special military operation got underway and, and that again just puts the pressure on the, the Russian leader. There has been criticism not of him directly but of uh, his military and of the campaign that they have been conducting uh, in uh, Ukraine and, and again I think that is part of the explanation yeah. for what we saw from Russia today. Kier we appreciate your reporting so much from on the ground inside Russia right now. Thank you very much. We are joined by retired Lieutenant General Ben Hodges former commander of U.S. Army Europe and a senior advisor at Human Rights First. And Bill Taylor, familiar to you, of course, as the former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine and vice president of Russia and Europe at the U.S. Institute of Peace. Uh, Lieutenant General Hodges, let me ask you if I can. How should Ukraine respond to these attacks at the risk of further escalating this war? Uh, Peter, there's there's nothing that Ukraine is going to do that's going to cause further escalation. Russia makes their own choices, and I thought Aaron's point earlier about the uh, this missile attack being planned long before the hit on the Kerch Bridge. Um, I mean, that many missiles, 13 different cities simultaneously. That's not something you just uh, wake up in the morning and, and yeah. execute. So I think they've been planning this for quite some time, and I really think this represents. Uh, a, I don't, know, I don't know if it's a new phase or a different approach by the Russians. Clearly, their operations, their military operations, are a failure, uh, and bringing in a new commander is not going to change that. So they're trying to 
uh, change the dynamic, uh, and also raise anxiety for everyone else to break the will, not of the Ukrainian people, that's not going to happen, but to break the will of the West to continue supporting Ukraine. Well, is that, I guess that's my question to you is what, I mean, this was just an awful series of strikes, the, the worst we've seen in months now, and, and though it's not going to, as you note, and apparently won't, certainly given the resilience we've seen in the Ukrainian people, it does feel like this was an effort to try to break the will of the Ukrainian people as you head into to the winter months where they target some of the infrastructure sites, you know, the ability to get energy to stay warm throughout the winter. Is, is that how you sort of view this calculation? And, and what should we anticipate with the addition of this new commander? Well, um, I spoke to a senior member of the RADA earlier today who describes this missile attack as the beginning of a new attempt at starvation uh, and to freeze the Ukrainians. So it's the timing of hitting uh, en energy infrastructure before the winter. It's clearly intended to make it miserable for people as the winter approaches. But also, and of course, this is in the fiber of Ukrainians. They remember the Holodomor, um, where millions of Ukrainians were starved by Stalin. And so they see what's happening now is another attempt by Russia to destroy Ukraine as a state and the idea of Ukraine as a state. This new commander, uh, apparently his major redeeming quality is that he's brutal. That's what everybody, how everybody describes him. But the problems that beset the Russian military are so deeply rooted that a new commander is not going to fix their logistic system, their inability to uh, conduct what we would call joint operations where you integrate air, land, and sea. Yeah, it's certainly not going to fix the challenges they face right now, but it, it doesn't look good for the, what the next several months will look like given the just the increased brutality uh, of what we saw in, within the last 24 hours. Ambassador Taylor, I want to ask you, based on those images that we're seeing again today, what message, in your view, is Vladimir Putin trying to send uh, by targeting critical infrastructure in these civilian buildings? One of the targets was one of the most popular parks in the center of Kiev. Which we've all been to, Peter. Uh, we've all been there. We know exactly what he's shooting for. And he's trying to change the subject. As General Hodges just said, he's losing on the battlefield. His, his army is not able to hold ground. He's not, he's hadn't been able to take any new ground. His army is being pushed back, way back in the north around Kharkiv. It's gradually losing ground. The Russians are gradually losing ground out around Kherson. So, so he's failing. His military is failing on the ground where it counts. That's the real important thing, Peter. I mean, the message is the Ukrainians are winning. They'll continue to win. President Putin is trying to do something to change that dynamic. General Hodges mentioned that he's got people, uh, Kier actually mentioned that uh, Putin has got people on his right flank who are yeah. dissatisfied. He hadn't been tough enough. He's also got people fleeing the country. He's got families who are hating this war with Russia, so much so they're leaving the country and never planning to come back. So President Putin has got a real problem. He's failing on the ground. He's got pol politics all over it. Uh, he's losing the support of China, India, um, and the United States, I believe, is going to increase the weapons that we provide to the Ukrainians to allow them to continue to push the Russians out of Ukraine. So give us the reality check here, Mr. Ambassador. I, I know that Vladimir Putin isn't winning this war, but certainly the Ukrainians aren't winning either. This is it's an awful situation, this siege on both Sides. He's dealing with the domestic pressure at home right now. H how much of this is, is meant for the audience in Russia? And it's hard to believe that Vladimir Putin at any reason, at, at any point, sees the reason to let his feet off, uh, off the gas. The target is the Russians. You're exactly right. He's concerned. He's he's been concerned. So, Peter, we remember that uh, for a while, for the last month or so, people are saying, he, "Mr. Putin is hurting for soldiers." How's he going to get soldiers? Well, they were trying to get soldiers out of prisons. Uh, they were trying to get soldiers from the Syrians, from the private sector, from the Libyans. Uh, now he's trying to he's trying to get the the Belarusians and and failing on this. So so Mr. Putin has a problem with soldiers, and he's looking for a way to change that subject. He's he's got real problems um, on on the on the military side. And General, uh, Lieutenant General Hodges, do these strikes in Ukraine, in your view, do they change the kind of military support we should anticipate from the West, what they provide to Ukraine? Well, I think the, uh, the clear fact that these are war crimes being committed against innocent 
European citizens is going to inspire uh, our allies as well as our own government to look for ways to help protect them. So the, at number one on the list of, of capabilities that Ukraine needs, obviously, is air and missile defense yeah. um, to protect the, the millions of people there that are being targeted. And then, Ambassador uh, Taylor, last question to you is, what is Vladimir Putin's off-ramp here? How does this end? He pulls his troops out of Ukraine, Peter. The off-ramp is to get the Russians out of Ukraine. And President Biden is not looking for an off-ramp. President Putin is looking for an off-ramp. That's He's the man who has to figure out the problem that he's in. He's in a real problem. He's got to find his own way out. And the way out is to pull the Russians out of Ukraine. General Hodges, how does it end? Well, it ends when the last Russian soldier uh, walks over either what's left of that bridge or gets on a ferry and leaves Crimea. That's when it ends. And then, of course, we cannot forget there are one million Ukrainians who have been kidnapped and deported yeah. and scattered around Russia. We have got to stay on top of that to get those people back home. Yeah, just such an awful situation that continues to play out uh, in that region. Lieutenant General Ben Hodges, Ambassador Bill Taylor, we appreciate both of your expertise in being with us. Thank you so much. Coming up right here, Republicans rally to Herschel Walker's side as the issue of abortion rights takes center stage in a race that could determine which party controls the Senate with less than a month to go before Election Day. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. National Republicans are now literally, figuratively, and financially rallying around to battle Georgia Senate candidate Herschel Walker as he continues to deny allegations first reported by the Daily Beast that he urged an ex-girlfriend to get an abortion and paid for the procedure. NBC News has not independently confirmed those allegations. But text messages provided to NBC by the Walker campaign show the woman texted Walker's wife on Friday about the abortion, writing, quote, did you know Herschel paid for my abortion the first time? Walker told NBC that Friday was the first time the woman mentioned she had the procedure to either him or his wife. Republican Senators Rick Scott and Tom Cotton are headed to Georgia tomorrow to campaign with Walker. And the party is sending more money to the state to beef up advertising for Walker. And with control of the Senate on the line, Republicans appear here to have decided that Georgia is just too important to lose. Here's Congressman Don Bacon on Meet the Press yesterday. By supporting Herschel Walker, given these allegations, is the GOP, are you sending a message that Republicans are willing to win at all costs? Well, I think people make mistakes. And if people acknowledge them and ask for forgiveness, uh, none of us are perfect. And also, we got to realize that but Senator Warnock has his own allegations. But he has that this is well. one of his mistakes. Do you want to hear more from him on this issue? It sounds like you still have questions. Well, I think it's just best to be candid. I, I've learned that in my own life, be candid, be honest. But in the end, this is going to be about policy positions. Joining me now from Atlanta with the very latest on the story is NBC correspondent Ali Rafa. Ali, Republicans are going all in on Walker, the bottom line, and they've said this openly now. The calculation is do whatever is necessary to flip that seat red to try to defeat Raphael Warnock. So who or what else do we expect to see from national Republicans in terms of their support of Herschel Walker? That's right, Peter. It's not lost on Republicans, both on the national level and the state level here. What's at stake here? As you mentioned, this evenly divided 50-50 Senate control of it could easily come down to this critical race. And that's why you're seeing all hands on deck here in Georgia. You're seeing the NRSC redirect ad funding money here instead of this New Hampshire Senate race. You're seeing staffers being added on the ground here in Georgia. And then the Walker campaign announced earlier today that Senators Rick Scott and Tom Cotton will be stumping for Herschel Walker here tomorrow. And that is, I think it's important to remember really who Rick Scott is. Remember, this is the leader of the effort to elect Senate Republicans. So that's basically providing this message to other Republicans that it's okay to back this guy. It's okay to stand by him. He may not be perfect, but he's the best we've got, and he's our best option to be able to have a chance at winning back the Senate. Uh, and so I don't think, uh, you know, he's saying, I don't think voters should be concerned about this, Republican voters, but really some of them are, specifically the state Republicans like Lieutenant Governor Jeff Duncan, who I spoke with this weekend, who talked about how frustrating it is that that uh, Herschel Walker is the best that the Republicans have in this state. Take a listen to what he told me. I want to give Herschel Walker all the time and that, that he needs to justify his case, and I don't want to, you know, 
uh, throw any sort of un untrue allegations his way, but we all felt this was going to be part of the process, and I think it's most Republicans are, are waking up realizing that this is this was coming, and uh, it's unfortunate because the problems are real in D.C. Uh, I need a U.S. senator that has a conservative strategy to go pretty much fire well off Joe Biden's bad ideas, right? As as a conservative Republican, uh, we need somebody to win that seat. The nation needs somebody to win that seat that's a conservative. A very different perspective uh, from the national Republicans that we are monitoring. So this is really a watershed moment when we see Senators Rick Scott and Tom Cotton on this stage with Herschel Walker tomorrow. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how, how many other Senate Republicans will come out on the campaign trail. A source close to Walker's campaign is telling NBC New that, News that they're hearing from Senate Republicans who are also eager to join him, Peter. You know, that interview is interesting because Lieutenant Governor Jeff Duncan there that you were speaking to is not running running for re-election right now. So it does sort of, you know, give him the free pass to say what he thinks and, frankly, what I think a lot of Republicans may think right now. I want the take, though. We see this from 35,000 feet a lot. We cover this from the national perspective. How, how is this playing on the ground there? Is this the lead story in the local newscasts, on the paper? How are voters viewing this issue on the ground in Georgia? It's a great question. You know, we've been monitoring the local newscasts here, and we've been talking to Republicans and Democrats. I can tell you, I watched the local newscast last night here, and it led with crime, inflation, high gas prices here in Atlanta. And I think the word to really describe the move on the ground for both parties is unfazed. You have Republicans saying that Herschel Walker's past is his past. It shouldn't be brought up in this campaign. There are more important issues at hand for voters here. And Democrats are saying that they don't want to rehash all of this, that there are more important things to look forward to. They're actually proud of Senator Raphael Warnock for not capitalizing this and using it to his advantage. Uh, but I can tell you that uh, something that both parties are telling me, voters in both parties, is they're very interested to see whether this is brought up uh, in a big way on the debate stage on Friday, Peter. Ali Rafa, we always appreciate your reporting on the ground there in Georgia. Thanks so much for that. And coming up next right here, we will get further into that Georgia Senate race, plus new contentious moments on the campaign trail, including former President Trump casting doubt on the validity of the upcoming 2022 election results and a sitting Republican senator's racist comments. That's next. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. As Republicans rush to Georgia to support Herschel Walker in battleground Arizona right now, President Trump campaign for the slate of Republican candidates there and once again pushed election denial conspiracies. This time, however, it was not just about 2020. Mr. Trump also suggested the 2022 midterms could also be rigged. And Republican Senator Tommy Tuberville is facing new backlash over racist remarks that he made at a rally in Nevada while trying to attack Democrats on crime. The Democratic Party, they have a majority. They could stop this crime today. They, some people say, well, they're soft on crime. No, they're not soft on crime. They're pro-crime. They want crime. They want crime because they want to take over what you got. They want to control what you have. They want reparation because they think the people that do the crime are owed that. <laughs> they are not owed that. Joining me now is our panel, Washington Post political reporter Eugene Scott, Simone Sanders Townsend, host of Simone on MSNBC and former chief spokesperson for Vice President Harris and Republican strategist Doug High. So let's let's go around the horn. We'll, we'll get to Tuberville in a second. I'm sure you all have strong opinions about that. There's no dispute. It was a racist comment. And, and I want to break that down about what he's trying to do here. But I want to ask you, Doug, quickly about Republicans as it relates to Herschel Walker. Clearly, the calculation has been made that all publicity is good publicity. We just got to go all in and do whatever we can to help Herschel Walker at this point. Yeah, you know, I'm reminded of that Friday evening when we found out that this tape called Access Hollywood on Donald Trump mm -hmm. came out. And this is the playbook now. Donald Trump has shown that people can survive these otherwise unsurvivable scandals. So Republicans are saying, well, we either are going to win a Senate race or lose a Senate race. Full steam ahead. So, Eugene, your takeaway from this is this, I mean, it does feel like this is the sort of new reality we live in in terms of our politics following 
the Trump years here. What do you see as you watch what's happening with the Herschel Walker situation? I feel like, to your point, the GOP response wasn't shocking. Just how quickly they uh, were able to figure out their message is significantly different from how things happened when Access Hollywood uh, occurred. Remember, back then, there were these Republicans speaking out against Trump, and then they kind of realized that the voters were still with him, and so they stayed with Trump. Almost immediately, the Republicans have come out supporting Herschel Walker. Their line was, we are focused on the future, that's in the past, and they are trusting that voters are doing the same thing. But we'll, what will be interesting, this is a race where independent voters are going to be significantly important. And whether or not these voters feel the same way as Trump's base and Walker's base remains to be seen. And aside from this issue, to be clear, if you've paid close any attention to this race, Herschel Walker has said so many things that would seem to disqualify him as a candidate in terms of his understanding of what it is to serve as a United States senator. Simone, what do you say? There's a big, there, there's a big debate coming up. You're going to have Raphael and Herschel Walker side by side. What would you advise Raphael Warnock and his campaign as they prepare for that night? I think that it is important, look, to point out the hypocrisy of Herschel Walker, right? He supports an, uh, a, a no abortions without any exceptions ever, not even in the life of a mother, not even in case of rape or incest. That's extreme. Um, so I think it's important to point out that hypocrisy, but also talk about the issues. You've seen Reverend Warnock continue to do that throughout his time on the campaign trail. He, he, he hits it just a little bit, says, I'm concerned about what I'm hearing, and he pivots and talks about the issues. I, I do think that the issues of crime, uh, jobs in the economy, cost of living, these are going to be things that dominate the debate in, um, in Georgia, that Senate debate on October 14th, as well as the issue of voting rights. Again, Georgia is a very specific place. The, the abortion will also be a piece of it, but not, I don't think Herschel Walker's hypocrisy will be the largest thing. Again, there is a six-week abortion ban recently signed in Georgia by the governor. These issues hit the local community there just a little bit different. When you hear from the Ted Cruz's, the Tom Cotton's, it's the Brian Kemp's that you don't hear from that gives you a sense about what much more mainstream Republicans think about Herschel Walker. But at the end of the day, they know it's D versus red on the ballot. Is that basically the baseline for a lot of these voters? That has been. Look, there's a reason that Mitch McConnell months ago warned about the lack of quality candidates mm -hmm. in Georgia and other states. This is, this is the coming home to roost on that. And if we lose this seat, Republicans lose it, this, this will be one of the reasons why, is first-time candidates usually struggle. Dr. Oz has actually run a pretty good campaign in Pennsylvania for a first-time candidate. Herschel's struggling, and now we have the personal issues that are affecting that as well. Yeah, the Dr. Oz issue, I think we could, I think people would dispute. Has Dr. Oz run a pretty good campaign right now? I mean, now? I mean, he, he was out here getting his hands on the Hollywood Walk of Fame <laughs> when he should have been campaigning. I don't necessarily think it's good. I do think, though, that Dr. Dr. Oz, Mehmet Oz, actually, has done a good job of distinguishing himself away from the gubernatorial candidate mm -hmm. in Pennsylvania, Doug Mastriano. Very extreme, all Trump all day, Doug Mastriano. Dr. Oz, my bad Oz is like, hey, you know what? I got some differences. I would have voted to certify the election. Yeah, well, that raises the topic of split tickets, which it seems like we're likely to see much more of yeah. uh, in, in this fall's elections. Let me ask you about the former president, Donald Trump. This weekend, he was in, uh, he was in Arizona, another battleground, preemptively casting doubt on the 2022 elections. Here we go all over again. Is that an effective message? Is that what folks on, here, on the ground want to hear? But well, Carrie Lake is certainly hoping so. I mean, I read a great piece this week that says she has figured out how to do Trump better than Trump. She's now the first lady of America. But is that in a state like Arizona, though, I, I know that's going to help the base, but is that going to draw over those folks right down the middle in a purple state like that? Well, it didn't in 2020. To, as we mentioned earlier, independents are key in this state as well. And she is farther right than most voters in Arizona. Whether or not they turn up to turn out against her, it's not clear yet. Peter, asking. we've seen the ramifications of this in Georgia from the runoffs that we had last cycle, yeah. where Donald Trump essentially suppressed the Republican vote. Now they're taking Cost that. Cost them two Senate seats. Exactly, and they're taking that nationwide now. Let me ask you about Senator uh, Tuberville right now, if I can. These comments, we saw them. They were clearly ignorant. They were racist. Those are the words of the NAACP. I think most people would agree to that. They were bigoted. That's according to the National Urban League. Republicans want to attack Dems on crime right now. But, Doug, as you hear that language how is that helping? Like, what is the calculation there? I get for the red meat audience, you know, they'll be like, Arr! but it's racism, pure and simple. It's, it's terrible and the kind of thing that you hope that he would explain and apologize for, but he'll probably just end up making it worse in, in doing so. It's a very salient issue, the issue of crime in, in these elections, the North Carolina Senate race, I think, probably most particularly. But comments like these do two things. One, further divide us on this and other issues, but also 
backfire on Republicans because the focus then is removed from where they want it to be on issues and on specific candidates. I want to, your takes about that. To yeah. be very clear, crime is an issue for all communities, but mm -hmm. crime we're using as an umbrella term. When we're talking about crime, what do we mean? In some places, like Texas, folks mean public safety, gun safety. In some other places, we're talking about public safety. In uh, Pennsylvania, the issue of crime has popped up because of uh, policies of the current governor and lieutenant governor and who they let at policies that allowed some people to be released early from prison. And so I think that the black and brown people want to feel safe in their communities, too. My mother would like to call the police if something is going wrong. She wants to know that when the police show up, that they're not going to treat her as the assailant. So keep an eye on races like Mandela Barnes in Wisconsin right now, where crime has really been a challenging issue for him. Ron Johnson, who's not a very strong candidate, no. is still having an advantage there because crime seems to be resonating. You just say one word, Kenosha. And for a lot of those folks in the suburbs and the exurbs in the rural areas, that resonates, Eugene. It does. I mean, people remember the summer of 2020. But even if that hadn't happened, demographics are very real. Most voters in Wisconsin are not Democrats. And so Mandela Barnes was working, uh, going up an uphill battle, regardless of whether or not this was uh, going to be the, the message that Ron Johnson moved forward. But since it is what he moved forward, and it is what so many of his voters remember to be true, we see Barnes having a much harder time than he was having earlier this Can I remind everybody, though, that Mandela Barnes has been elected statewide. He got elected yes. mm -hmm. in 2019. One could argue he helped carry Governor Evers, who, you know, I've met Governor Evers, lovely man, not necessarily the most inspiring cookie in the cookie box. <laughs> so I, I think the fact that he has been elected statewide, the people of Wisconsin know him, he has not been attacked. And I think what has mm -hmm. happened is these ads attacking him have definitely stuck on with voters. And the, the Barnes campaign and the um, DSCC, they need to triangulate very quickly and hit back. They just can't let this go on in. Governor Evers on line three when you get off the set. <laughs> oh, you're not going to be happy. We're going to make sure we put him through to your cell if I can quickly. Just the last thought I want to get from you, Simone, again, is on the topic. We heard this just yesterday on Meet the Press. We were hearing from Alyssa Slotkin. She's up for a key race in Michigan right now. She talked about the need for new blood in the Democratic Party. How urgent is that need right now when you see a president like Joe Biden, and the top three leaders in Congress for the Democrats were all in their 80s. So I think Alyssa Slotkin is speaking from a very particular position of someone who would like to get into leadership in the House, and I think that there is, a, there is an argument to be made there. When it comes to talking about the president, I, I hear folks, look, the president is the president is an older American, okay? He is he is not a spring chicken, per se, but the voters voted for him. And so if folks would like new blood, they need to be able to win a primary. And if you look back at 2020, where a number of individuals, 20 by my last count, ran, none of them could be Joe Biden. And so if you want new blood, run a primary and beat him. But I'd highly doubt if the president decides to run for re-election, there'll be a Democratic challenger to step up. Simone, Doug, Eugene, appreciate all you guys. Thanks for being here for a great panel today. Coming up next right here, rising tensions in Iran as massive anti-government protests enter a fourth week despite what has been a brutal crackdown, the significance of the women-led movement and where the demonstrations go from here. That's next. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back to Meet the Press Now. Anti-government protests in Iran are showing no sign of letting up, even as police brutally crack down there. The protests were originally spurred by the death of Masa Amini after she was arrested by Iran's so-called morality police. Two other teenage girls have died while involved in the protests, further fueling demonstrators' angers. Iranian authorities have denied that they were involved in either of the deaths, claims that have been condemned by international aid groups. We should note that NBC has not independently verified those reports. But despite the danger, women and girls have continued to join this protest. Some female university students in Tehran even took off their headscarves and heckled Iran's president when he visited the school last week. And an op-ed in the New York Times describes how, quote, schoolgirls with backpacks and black Converse sneakers joined the revolt. They marched down a street in a suburb of Tehran, the capital, waving their school uniform veils in the air. Azede Mavini is the author of that op-ed, and she joins me now. Azede, I appreciate your being with us. You were just in Tehran as these protests grew. What is it about the protests in the streets there that are making them so significant, that make this such a unique moment, and how does it compare to what we saw, say, back in 2009? Well, what's different about this round of protests is that they are extraordinarily broad-based. 
they cut across traditional dividing lines in Iranian society. So they're bringing out uh, people from different class backgrounds, from different ethnic groups, they're scattered all across Iran's regions. So geographically diverse, um, people of all different ages. I saw 70 year olds out there. I saw mothers wearing headscarves who were taking out their teenagers who are not wearing their headscarves. Um, so it's incredibly broad based. So even if the numbers aren't huge, the solidarity behind it is massive. And it's really, I think, a unique point in which the state is staring out at a society that is moved on. The state is as though it's on a different planet than these young protesters. They're Gen Z, they're sophisticated, they're plugged into global culture. They're very secular and educated, and they're just not willing to accept morality policing any longer. And one of the things um, that struck me, I was going to say, as I read your, uh, your column today, was this idea that it's really sort of the different hijab laws as they relate to the elite and the well-connected and to those more ordinary Iranians in that country. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, that's something that is, I think it's hard to pick up on unless you've spent significant amounts of, of time inside Iran in, in recent years. But morality policing has exactly become very selective. Uh, there are parts of the city where working class people, working university students come and go. Metro stations, the place where Masa Amini was picked up. Um, these places are patrolled, maybe not daily, but you know, women walking through them always have the fear that they could be picked up and something um, on their bodies gets them in trouble. Whereas there's many pockets of Iran where the regime's elite, young people affiliated and who've become wealthy through the system, they enjoy uh, villa parties and they live in mansions and their um, lifestyles are, are detailed on Instagram. So this kind of different social freedom that can be afforded by an elite class is something that ordinary Iranians see. And I think it fills them with real fury. Why do some people have freedoms based on their privilege while the majority do yeah. not. And I, I think the takeaway that a lot of people watching this are asking is where this goes, where this leads. There are now reports that oil workers are, are going in on these anti-government strikes. How does that escalate the situation there? Where do you view this going right now? Well, it's a it's a really important question, uh, and and it's hard to tell. Um, we do, as you say, see the protests persisting. They're expanding into different spaces, into into high schools, into oil fields, into strikes of different kinds. Um, it seems as though the state is just trying to muddle through. It wants to avoid a really bloody confrontation. At the same time, it doesn't want to concede. Um, but these movements, you know, this movement is leaderless and there's no interlocutors for the state you know any opposition has long been marginalized out of politics so the state really has no one to even dialogue with it's really isolated and cut itself off from society so much so what happens now the state could respond in a way that radicalizes the situation or the movement could radicalize itself by simply being um ferociously uh, unsatisfied with how iran's leaders are responding to it so i think things can never go back to how they were, but exactly how they will end up, it's really hard to see right now. And the last question, perhaps, is what more you think the U.S. government could <clears throat> could be doing, what specifically it should be doing right now to try to help support this effort? Uh, that's another tricky question. Um, the United States is in a situation where it doesn't really have a great deal of options. Um, it has not been able to reestablish uh, a diplomatic relationship with Iran properly through, through the nuclear deal that President Trump withdrew from. Um, it has imposed economic sanctions that have impoverished Iranians and that have really formed some of the, the backdrop, the economic um, kind of devastation that is the backdrop and the context to these protests. Um, I see the United States response Responding by sanctioning the morality police. Um, these are sort of feel-good sanctions. Um, in, in effect, they're quite silly. They target groups in Iran that don't make policy about these issues. Um, it makes sort of countries feel good as though they're going, you know, directly on the offensive uh, against against what these protesters have 
up against, but I think what would be more productive is looking at measures that help civil society. You know, what can keep the internet open? What kind of sanctions exemptions could allow civil society to breathe again? You know, what are the restrictions that have kept Iran so isolated? That kind of forward-looking action, I think, would be quite welcome. Azadi Mavini, we really appreciate you making time and sharing your perspective with us. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Still to come right here, how to protect players in the NFL. We're going to talk to a head trauma expert on the league's new concussion protocol, the future of health and safety in professional football. That is next. You're watching Meet the Press now. In effect, this weekend, when the NFL players return to the field, the new, more stringent rules broaden the list of symptoms that prohibit a player from returning to a game after a hard hit. The move comes after questions were raised into how the Miami Dolphins handled quarterback Tua Tunga Vailoa's medical examination after a suspected head injury last month. A joint investigation by the league and the Players Association, the NFL and the NFLPA, found that while the league protocol had been followed, quote, the outcome in this case was not what was intended when the protocol was drafted. We're joined now by Chris Nowinski. Uh, he is a concussion expert and the CEO of the Concussion Legacy Foundation. Chris, I appreciate your being with her. I've been paying attention to your comments about this as, as we've watched the awful situation with Tunga Vailoa with the Dolphins. So I, I want your take on the NFL's new concussion protocol that was announced over the weekend. Are these reforms enough to be effective? Yeah, the question is how much of an effect do they want? The, the change in the wording to the protocol is actually not really a change at all. They're basically saying what used to be gross motor impairment and but the doctor could determine if it was another cause. That still exists. They just sort of moved some words around and added ataxia to the list of no-go symptoms. And that sort of shows us that at the NFL level, the pro level, the goal is not necessarily safety for the players, uh, but the players have a seat at this table. They don't want to be held out when they don't have a concussion, uh, and the NFL wants them on the field uh, when they don't have a concussion. So they 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 don't want to make a mistake in that direction, and that causes them to make mistakes in rushing guys back who shouldn't be out there. Uh, that's a big risk to take with such well-paid athletes with big futures. You know, my own career at WWE was ended by two concussions too close together that I didn't report uh, but I know what this can do to you. So we're talking a lot about it being better. I don't know if the protocol is better, but the bigger picture is that this protocol is not what sh you should apply with your own kids. This is really a professional protocol that's designed in a certain way, and it's not erring on the side of caution like you would want with younger kids or high school but athletes. That seems like a flawed system, certainly in a sport where not all contracts are guaranteed, right? I mean, as you said, as it relates to Tua Tunga Vailoa, you said after the, the the situation there were a reminder to folks he got knocked down once, appeared to be unstable. They said it was like a head and back thing. It was obviously something much more serious than that. And then the next week, he returned to the game the next week, got knocked, and that was that awful hit that gave him a serious concussion. You said of him, you said, if I was Tua, I would not trust this team anymore. At some point, the system was created to rely not just on the team or the team doctors, but on what they call this UNC, the Unaffiliated Neurotrauma Consultant. That person was fired by the union, the one that took a look at Tua Tunga Vailoa at the time. But shouldn't that outside person have the players' interest, their health and safety, when they're involved in this position? Yeah, you know, I think the unaffiliated doctors being set up as a bit of a scapegoat here because actually the final call is the team doctor's call, no matter what the unaffiliated consultant says. Yeah, I think they both came to the wrong decision here, and it still boggles my mind of how they saw him grab his helmet and shake his head and thought it could be anything else. Like, that's a failure. But the other problem with the failure is that everybody saw that. The coaches saw it, the right. ownership saw it. So it's it's one mistake to let him back into the game because a lot of things are happening quickly. But for the Dolphins to not sober up and realize Monday morning that they watched that film and see they'd made a mistake and to roll the dice with his entire future and put him in on Thursday, that's the conversation that still needs to happen. Yeah. What kind of culture creates this experience for such a great player with a bright future? The Dolphins head coach is a guy by the name of Mike McDaniel. You know him as well as anybody as a sports fan. He said about Tonga Vailoa's situation that he didn't have anything more serious than a concussion, seemingly dismissing the idea that concussion wasn't serious. The Dolphins did pull their backup quarterback, Teddy Bridgewater, from the game under these new rules over the weekend. But I guess my, my last question to you is what needs to happen still 
for you to be confident that the league is taking this more seriously? I, you know, it's a good question of what needs to happen still, because I, you know, again, this is still a negotiated process. You know, one of the bigger problems here is that, you know, we're talking about concussions this week, but probably the bigger existential problem for the NFL is chronic traumatic encephalopathy or CTE. Yeah. And what we'll soon be talking about over and over again is the fact that I don't think the players understand the risks they're out there taking uh, based on some conversations I had in the off season with some guys who've been in the league for a long time. So right now, I mean, we can talk about let's get that concussion call right, but we still have to worry about them 10, 20 years down the road, and we aren't addressing that in a big way. Yeah, that's so hard to believe given all the, the headlines we've seen about families donating their loved ones' brains to be studied after they've seen concussions in their loved ones who ultimately took their lives or had uh, had an awful loss of life. Chris Nowinski, we appreciate your time, and you're coming on to talk about this important topic with us. Thanks so much, and thanks to you for Thank joining you for us me. for this important hour of news. I'm going to be back tomorrow with more Meet the Press. Now, NBC News Now coverage continues with Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.